he's messing around with me a little bit. He was like, yo, I'm gonna foul you next time you try to go flying in there to dunk and we, we going back and forth. I said, hey, I said, I know it's for the game. He's working on the same move. He was, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I gotta perfect it, I gotta perfect it. Little snippet there of an on-court exchange in the NBA between Saluki legend Chris Carr and the late Kobe Bryant. Six years in the NBA for Chris Carr and maybe the highlight, the finals of the 1997 dunk contest where Kobe Bryant was his opponent. Relationship between those two evolved a little later on and Chris Carr will touch on that here coming up. But it all started as a kid from Pilot Knob, Missouri. Recruited by Rich Heron to the Saluki basketball program in the early 90s. And Chris Carr went from role player to 1995 Missouri Valley Player of the Year. And as a junior, won the scoring title with 22 points per game. They never missed. The Salukis never missed when Chris Carr was on the team. Three years, three NCAA tournaments. And after those three years, he went to the NBA. After he was done playing professionally, he got into coaching. He's now in his fifth season coaching women's basketball at Kansas State, and he's currently coaching his daughter, who's a junior, as uh, they kick off their season here in about two weeks. Here's Chris Carr on the Saluki Standards Podcast. I tell you, I was was going through some memorabilia the other day. I found a signed picture of yours from back in the day. It was signed, (laughs) stay cool. And then your yeah. autograph, Chris Carr. Is that how you sign everything? With stay, was, stay cool. That was that was um, that was that was kind of my my deal for for a long time. Just because people want you to sign and and write this and write that and write happy birthday to my my best friend's cousin's nephew's niece on my dog side of the family, and they want you to write all this stuff. And it's like, you know what? Let me find something that's easy to write, is quick, and it's effective because you know. When I was in college, the number one thing I always used to say is like, everybody, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm cool. And then so when I, that became kind of my thing. And so I was like, ah, you know, you tell everybody, hey, stay cool. So that was, that was my, my deal in college. So, yeah, it was uh, pretty simple yet right to the point. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Obviously, the, the picture of you, I think you were Duncan or something like that, uh, as, as you often were. But the stay cool part was the thing that, that stood out to me. That was unique. <laughs> There you go. Uh, a lasting impression. That, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. What's the weirdest thing somebody's asked you to sign? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I hope my wife doesn't see this, but I've actually been asked to sign a woman's uh, chest before. So that's been probably the most interesting. Um, been asked to sign a couple butts, which is odd. Um, what else? Uh, um, you know, hats, shoes, socks, basketballs, that's all kind of normal. Um, yeah, I think probably having to sign, yeah, a woman says, hey, sign my chest. And they're like, uh, you know, so that, that was, that was, a uh, that was pretty, pretty unique to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't ask any follow-ups in case your wife does listen. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, well, 2020, uh, you know, it, there's, there's been a lot of news, obviously, but I feel like the, the narrative of 2020 kind of started with the bad news when Kobe Bryant passed away in January. And you've got kind of a unique connection to Kobe competing against him in the dunk contest in 97. What was your reaction when you heard about his passing? Well, initially, you know, we were, I was in the office, we had uh, film and meetings later that day. So I came up here early and I was over on the men's side with um, Chris Lowry and and Jermaine Henderson and Brad Corn. They were all in watching film and doing stuff. And we were, it was weird because we were literally just having the conversation about like eras of basketball. And we were, you know, the, obviously the, always the conversation goes to, LeBron, MJ, Kobe, Kevin Durant, you know, who's the greatest and this, that, and the other. And, you know, I was, I was, we were talking about it and it literally it popped up on the, like it, it hit everybody's phone at the same time and then it popped up on the TV. Uh, Kobe Bryant's been involved in a helicopter accident, presumed it. And I was like, no, nah, that's a sick joke. And then it was um, TMZ reported it. And it was like, eh, why is TMZ reporting something? And so we we started looking through like the 
HLN, CNN, like looking for something. It's like, well, they're not reporting it, so it's not true. And we go back to ESPN, there was a college game on, and then it popped up on the ticker on there, and then it went to a breaking news. And, and for me, it was just kind of like very surreal, very um, sad, because it's, I had literally just spoke to him in the fall about – uh, one of his business ventures that he was a, a part of called the uh, um, Mamba Vision. And it is a, it is a program that you put on an iPad to help you with um, game simulated um, visual recognition. So like for um, pitchers or hitters, they uh, see a pitcher coming out of his hand with a pitch and like, can you recognize what pitch it is here? Can you recognize it when it's coming off his fingertips? Can you recognize it when it's, 30 feet from the plate and you're taking these little bitty constant cues um, to train yourself to what to visually focus on. And um, him and Mark Cuban actually had um, developed this. K-State, we had experimented with it some in last summer. And I spoke to Coach Mitty and was like, hey, I want to go out and spend two days with them and just kind of learn more about it if it's something that we're going to purchase because it was at that time it was exclusively offered to Kansas State I don't know how our athletic director worked that out but friends with somebody that we were one of the first uh, college programs that could experiment with it and we're going to purchase it and then we ended up not doing it because it was too a little bit too complex for like football to be able to use it and if football wanted it then everybody would have got it so um, that part of it was was very like you know disheartening saddening and then just to know the effect that he had on so many people, then it became like very, very just, you know, you, you become thankful for the time that you did have with them and the time to compete against them on the court and dunk contest and, and being able to see him as he grew as a player, as a person, as a father, as a man, as a husband. I mean, you know, he had some trials, but he, he grew from it and became a better person to the point where, you really had an appreciation for him when his career was done. And that's always one of those things. You wait until someone's gone and you have a real appreciation for him whenever he was a modern day artist right here in front of us. And, but because everybody's so competitively driven, you could never take the time to really appreciate his true mastery and the things that he added to the culture of today's sporting athletes. Did you guys get a chance to share a moment during that dunk contest or did the relationship evolve later? Um, no, he, he really wasn't uh, talkative. You know, people talk about how he was as a, as a rookie and that's, that's no lie. Like the book um, three rings that just recently came out or, or three ring circus um, with Phil, Kobe, Shaq and that whole of their championship, their three peat or whatever. And my, one of my, memorable interactions I played for the Bulls and the Lakers were in town I like to get to the arena a I didn't like driving through traffic so I'd always leave my home in Chicago at like three three forty five to drive downtown to the United Center and I was always the first one in the arena but I liked that because I could get the the ball boys were there they'd all have a basketball and I could get up my 300 shot routine before the game and so I like to shoot while nobody's in there. So when the teams start to come in and people filter out to the court, I've already had a chance to focus on getting my rhythm. I, I was like that in college too. So it's just a weird thing about me, right? When I walk in the arena, I'm used to being the first one there. Well, Kobe's at the other end of the court and he's down there and he's, he's um, working on this move and he's working on shooting a fadeaway jump shot. One dribble, fake, right shoulder turn, fadeaway shoot. One dribble fake. And he, and he just, same spot on the court, just keeps making the same move over and over and over. So I go through my whole shooting routine. And I'm done. I should make my free throws. And I'm leaving the court. He's still in the same spot working on the same move. And so we get in the game. And I'm like, so I was like, it kind of intrigued me. So I, like, I, doing a free throw, I was like, hey. He's like, he's messing around with me a little bit. He was like, Yo, I'm gonna foul you next time you try to go flying in there to dunk, and we we going back and forth. I said, hey, I said I know it's for the game. He's working on the same move. He's he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I gotta perfect it. I gotta perfect it. He said, I gotta I gotta figure out how to perfect it. And uh and and I was like, 
okay. And I said, well, you couldn't work on other stuff? And he's like, nah, nah, I got to perfect it. In my mind, I got to perfect that move. He says, next time you see me, I might be working on another move. I might be working on the same, I don't know. But that move right now for where I'm at, I got to perfect that. And I was like, okay. You know, and, I, and, and so that that is just one story of many that you hear about him and his um, type A, highly driven personality that, that just kind of fits into what the many experiences of what other guys have with him, um, both USA basketball and, the, you know, playing in the Olympics and, you know, him just doing the stuff that he did. So that was probably my most, my most memorable. And then the first – when I played for Golden State briefly earlier that year, it was his first game back after he had broke his hand. And um, we checked in the game at the same time, ironically enough, and I was like, we were, we we're sitting down the score, uh, on the floor in front of the scores table, and he say, um, I said, you do realize if I get a chance to smack you on that hand, I'm going to do it. And he kind of just laughed, and he was like, and if it's in the middle of my fadeaway, I'm going to kick the you-know-what out of you. <laughs> and we both just chuckled. And I, and I said, welcome back, man. He's like, hey, thanks. I appreciate it. And that was kind of kind of it. So, yeah, that's just that's just him. It's um, thankful for the time that we got an opportunity to have him bless us with his knowledge, work ethic, and ability to impact people. And, you know, just hope that we can continue that. It sounded like it got a little playful sometimes when you did interact with him. Did he ever dog you for beating you in the dunk contest? Um, no, he uh, he he didn't. He he never he never did. And the one thing about it, he actually never really liked being a part of the dunk contest. Um, not many, not a lot of people know that, but he was so mad at the fact that he didn't win the rookie game MVP, and he had scored like thirty two points. But Allen Iverson had a triple double and. Um, and they gave it to Allen Iverson. So he was kind of mad about that. And so, like, the, he's like, you know, the dunk contest was a consolation prize. And so, but, so now nah, we never really ever, ever interacted about that other than, you know, we went into our post-game press, con post press conference after the deal. He was just like, I mean, the dunk contest is cool, but I want to be the best player in the world. And I was like, yeah, that's where he's at with it. So, yeah, so that was, that was really, really bad. I, I do tell people this all the time. I said, you know, when, when Kobe got to heaven, God is like, Hey, Kobe, come on in. I got to be honest with you. Chris actually won the dunk contest. Now you can come on in. So, so, uh, but I, but yeah, I think that God was probably honest with him when he walked into the pearly gates. So I can live with that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. You, I, I watched that back. You were very, very confident in that event. You played the crowd. Well, Obviously, you had a couple of good dunks to get you into the finals and, and compete with Kobe. Um, I mean, why were you so confident going into that thing? Well, I mean, well, like, so my rookie year, Michael Finley and I were teammates. And as a rookie, Michael Finley won the dunk contest. And I was like, that's crazy that he wins and he can't even beat me in a dunk contest after practice. Um, and so that's, that was what gave me some sense of confidence. Like this, will this will be, be good for me. And, um, to at, at that point, like I was just, that was just one of the things that you, you did, you know, and, and to get chosen to, to do that, it was, a, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. And then I mean, you're out there, it's you all by yourself, 22,000 people in Gund Arena and millions of people watching. And it's just you. I mean, me as a young player in the NBA, I mean, how often do you get a chance to do that? You know, I mean, kid from Pilot Knob, Missouri, Southern Illinois, nobody heard of, thought of until I just said, I'm going to the NBA. And now you're a couple years in and you're in the, on one of the biggest stages in the whole world on the weekend that they're celebrating the NBA's 50 greatest. I mean, that's, a, that, that's probably the more memorable part about that for me is that I got a chance to meet so many guys that had paved the way for me and, and made it possible for me to even have an opportunity. Guys I looked up to, emulated, and I'm, I'm, now I'm sitting in a room with all of them. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> Who was the guy that you, that you met that weekend that you were like, whoa, I, I can't believe that I'm sitting next to this person? Well, the, the, probably the, the first one was, um, that was my first interaction with Bill Russell. Um, obviously I had played with Charles, my rookie or Charles Barkley. And so I'd gotten to meet 
David Robertson, you know, playing against him. Obviously, MJ had hung out with him, had been to his house a couple of different times. Um, so the that that modern era of players, I was pretty familiar with Reggie Miller, Scottie Pippen, you know, all of those guys. But um, Oscar Robertson, I had met him and Walt Frazier because they had both came back and spoke at Southern Illinois for our um, preseason banquet. Um, Walt Frazier came my freshman year and Oscar Robertson came my sophomore year. So I got a chance to meet them. So being able to see them again now as a, as a pro was uh, pretty special for me. Um, and so it was, it was just kind of just like a Dr. J I think was the one that was the most, because I mean, Dr. J is the smoothest dude around him and George Gerving. I mean, those dudes are super smooth. They dress smooth. They carry themselves. I just, classy 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 guys and so getting a chance to like walk in the room and they're they're there and, and i'm like a little kid in the candy shop and i'm like i got my best friend with me this little five eight white guy from my hometown he's nervous as i'll get out because i got him a pass to come with me to the uh to the um banquet when we first get to all-star weekend right and um it's just a meet and greet and so many of the players are there and he was like, are you going to ask for any autographs? I'm like, no, you dummy. You got to ask for autographs. You just smile and shake their hand. And he sat at the table by himself. He refused. He was like, I'm so nervous. I'm going to pee myself. So just being able to walk around and speak to those guys and, hey, how you doing? And they're like, oh, hey, young fella, how's it going? You know, and, and I'm, like, oh, I'm good, man. Welcome, man. Glad you're here. It's like, nobody can ever take that from you, that you're part of the most exclusive club in the world. Yeah. And that's the brotherhood of the NBA. Nobody can take that from you. And no matter what you do in life, nobody can take that from you. And so that that's really what I took from it. It's just a special moment for me to be able to meet those guys and be around. And that was a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I never got the sense that you were starstruck on the court, but it sounds like there might have been a little bit of that when you're in the room with those greats. Oh, yeah. Well, on the court, you you don't have a chance to be. I'll never forget the first time I played against Michael Jordan my rookie year. We're playing in Chicago. It's um, Super Bowl Sunday, and we're the primetime game. We're playing the noon game on Super Bowl Sunday. And I'm at the scorer's table, and I check into the game, and Mike Michael Jordan's standing at half court. It's my rookie year, and I'm like – I'm actually going in the game against Michael Jordan. Six hours from where I played college basketball, I would have never in my life, no matter how much I dreamed and that I wanted it, would have never, ever thought this day was coming. And then I walk in the game, and he's standing there, and, and uh, I, I point, I, uh, Finn, I got you. Michael Finley's walking off the court, and I dap him up, and then MJ's standing, he looks over his shoulder, and he sees me, he's like, Chris Carr. I was like, is that, he's like, hey, he says, man, you having a heck of a year, man. Keep keep working, all right? He, uh, he kind of bumped me on the leg a little bit, and I was like, okay, so now if nothing else ever happens the rest of my life, Michael Jordan just called me by my name and spoke to me. And I was like, and then, and then it quickly, it, it dawns like, oh, crap, I got to guard him. <laughs> uh oh, you know. So yeah. So it's um. But you you get over that pretty quick once you get in. That, once you you get into it, you you quit being. My first trip through the NBA, every night I was like awestruck. It was just like it was crazy. I mean, I'm walking the locker room every night with Charles Barkley, AC Green, Kevin Johnson. I'm like, all right, that's really cool. Got to know Charles, so it wasn't that big of a deal. At the fact I'm playing with one of the best three power forwards ever to play the game. So I took that for granted that I go to dinner with them every other night or that we hang out or whatever, right? Okay, it got no problem. But then it's like when we go on the road and he's like, he says, hey, come on, you're going with me. we going to eat dinner with Hakeem Olajuwon. You're like, what? You know, and then you're like, wow, okay. You know, he's a, you know, we go back to Philly and he's like, hey, hey, come on, we're going to meet uh, – with Moses and uh, Andrew Tony, Moses Malone and Andrew Tony. I was like, "Wow, yeah, cool." And and you're sitting there at dinner with them, and they're talking back and forth. And I'm I'm like, "Where do I fit in like, here?" <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, I'm just, gonna sit and just listen, just take it in. Yeah, just take yeah. it in because that. Um, but no, those are those are experiences that 
not many people get and then you cherish them when you get them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's so great. Um, a little bit about your, your upbringing. I mean, were you growing up in, in Pilot Knob, Missouri, were you a child prodigy at basketball? Did, did people kind of expect you to go Division One, maybe have a shot to go pro, or, or did you bloom late? Oh, no, I was a super-duper late bloomer. So, hold on, just come in. Just come back still. Oh, okay. I got to sign it? Mm-hmm. Okay. But I'm waiting on you to do it. No, you busy? Yeah, I'm doing a, yeah. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Recruiting coordinator. Yeah. So, um, so growing up, I actually, I wanted to be a baseball player. I was going to be the next Ozzie Smith. So I love baseball growing up. Basketball was fun. My my brothers, sisters had all played it. So I was like, yeah, this is, this is great. You know, appreciate it. Um, And then I got to my freshman year of high school and Actually, it's my summer before my eighth grade year of middle school. I just bought this brand new skateboard. And I still, to this day, I am scarred by this. And this is a story not a lot of people know. I used to love skateboarding. Absolutely loved it. Was going to be a professional skateboarder. Like uh, Tony Hawk. That was one of the guys that I grew up watching. And, and I just loved skating. And it was a lot of fun. And I could do all the tricks. And that's back when I was still flexible. So that was a lot of fun, right? And I'm at the high school parking lot one day and I'm skateboarding and my high school coach is up in the gym and I didn't know they were having open gym anyway. So that was irrelevant to me. I'm skating, I'm out doing tricks and hitting the launch ramp and you know, everything. And my high school coach comes up and says, Hey Chris, come here. I go up there. I was like, Hey coach. And he's like, he says, Hey, he says, do you ever plan on playing in this gym for me? And I was like, well, yeah, coach. I, yeah. When I get to high school. Yeah. He says, no, he says, do you ever plan on playing for me in this gym? Yeah. He says, okay. He says, well, you got a choice to make right now. He says, uh, you give me that skate that he said, he called it a dummy board. He said, you give me the dummy board, you get in this gym and get to work and don't ever question me or B you can keep the dummy board and keep doing what you're doing. And you probably gonna end up being a loser. And that was his, uh, that was the alternative. That was the ultimatum. And so I thought that maybe he'll be giving him my skateboard that I had saved up a whole year to buy. I thought that that meant like, well, he'll just take it now. He don't want to skateboard in the gym. Whenever we're done working out, he'll give it back to me and I can take it home, whatever. Never seen it again. Have no idea to this day where it went to. What had, It dissip, dissipated into thin air. So, but through that process, I started working and getting better. And I was, I was little, you know, freshman in high school, I'm five, five, sophomore in high school, I'm five, 10, skinny as a rail, you know, junior year. Now I'm six, two, six, two and a half senior year. I'm six, four and a half. Um, but I just steadily was getting better, getting better, getting better, getting better. And, um, Marcus Timmons, old high school coach, um, told Sam Weaver, Hey, there's a kid over here. I just went up to watch this game. I just watched this kid score 30 points and grab 30 rebounds. And he said, I quit block, counting his block shots after about eight. You guys better come get him. I think he's a, he's a diamond in the rough. Coach Weaver comes to watch me play. Um, at the end of the game, I come out locker room. He's speaking to my mom. So I'm like, it's either really good or really bad. And then, so from there, it kind of just took off. I, people expected me to do what all the other good players from our, um, our, our school does. They expected me to go to high school, then go to uh, local junior college. And then if anything came from that, then just, you know, I could go on from there and it would be okay, right? And that was all the expectation. My brother played at Three Rivers Community College. Um, had friends that had played at Middle Area Community College. That was kind of this, the, yeah, if you're good, you'll go to Three Rivers. If you're really good, you'll go to Three Rivers. If you're just good, you'll go to Mac. Three Rivers always beat you. And then from there, you know, you'll go to some small four-year school, Southwest Texas or somewhere, anywhere. And, you know, you'll probably end up back here pumping gas. That's kind of the norm. So nobody really expected that. But then whenever I started talking about, I think I want to go D1, and I had Southwest Missouri recruiting me, St. Louis University recruiting me, um, Arkansas, Arkansas, Little Rock recruiting me. 
Um, then everybody's like, wow, that's uh, well, you're not good enough to play with the big boys anyway. So it didn't really hit people until after I had went to school and, and really worked my way into becoming a much better player before people were like, whoa, didn't see that coming. So yeah, that was more of my story than the everybody expected me to be great. Right, right. Yeah. Pumping gas instead, he went to the NBA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your your freshman year, definitely more of a role player. It was Ashraf Amaya's show at, at that point. And, you know, then, then he leaves your sophomore year with him gone. What did that change for you? Um, you know, I, I was so thankful for um, Ashraf because he – he really helped me. I was at a pivotal point whenever I came to Southern Illinois because I, I had always typical kid going to division one. You always think that you know what it's like to work hard and play hard until you have to play hard at the division one level. And then you soon come to realize, I don't really know what hard work is. And, and I was so thankful for him having a senior from day one, he took me under his wing and everything I do, you do what I do. Um, and, you know, he was very honest with me. He says, hey, right now you ain't in the rotation, but you got to stay in shape. So every time you're not in a drill in practice, go run two sets of sprints on the sideline and then come back. And then when they sub people in, if they don't sub you in again, go run two more sprints. He said, and then it was go, go do two sprints and do 10 push-ups. And he's like, now if they sub you in, now you go in and do what you're supposed to do. And if they don't sub you in, keep doing that. And like when he would, they would sub him out, he'd be like, hey, come on, he'd run with me. And so he really taught me how to be a hardworking college athlete. Um, so then I carried that into my sophomore year and I got off to a, a blazing start my sophomore year. I mean, I was, I was um, really primed to have a really big year and I hurt my knee. Um, I, tear my MCL in my left knee um, against Ole Miss, the game I have my first career high. Mirko Pavlovich tries to draw a charge, and I'm standing there after the whistle, and he kind of stumbles and falls down. He falls into the outside of my knee, and I, my knee buckles inward, and I tear my MCL. So I played on that like December, January, and then February it started to finally feel better, and that's why you'll see if you look at my stats, like November, 20-some points a game, December, January, like dips down to like eight or nine points a game. And then I started the season the way I finished the season, averaging 22 over about my last five or six games. And um, then had a big MVC tournament and then played well in the NCAA tournament. So, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. And we had a great, great team. We had five starters averaging double figures. And I mean, obviously led by, Paul and Marcus, and um, then myself and Mirko Pavlovich, and then, of course, Chris Lowry was the one who was in charge of making sure we all got shots, which I got the least amount out of all of them. I remind him of that all the time. <laughs> I mean, Southern had a good team before you got there, uh, NIT teams before you got there, and then your freshman year, you, you guys go to the first NCAA tournament since the late 70s. What were your expectations going into it? Did you think that it would turn into what it turned into? Um, well, you know, my, it was interesting because as, a, as an individual, you know, I, I only lost, like, in four years of high school basketball, I only lost, like, 15 games. And I went 13 and 12 my freshman year, my uh, sophomore year of varsity basketball, and we lost 10 games in overtime. So – knew how to compete. My junior year, we go 24 and six. And then, or no, 24 and four. My senior year, we go 26 and two. So I'm 50 and six. So I'm thinking, well, I'm a winner. So I'm just win. You know, everybody's talking about, oh, we got to win this game so we can get at large. Oh, we got to win this game, get in the NCAA tournament. I'm like, how about we just go win when we're supposed to win and just go? You know, I didn't realize how much went into it. And, um, as a freshman, I didn't realize how much pressure there was on just making it to the NCAA tournament. I didn't, I didn't just call it just aloof. I don't know, but I just really didn't have an idea, right? So we make it. My friend beat Illinois State in the championship game, like smack them pretty good, right? Mike Vandergaard, we beat him up. 
So then coming back my sophomore year, it was like, you know, oh, can the Salukis do it again? The conferences, you know, you got Tulsa that's really on the rise. They were just, they were on their last two years being in the Missouri Valley. You got um, Bradley, who's an up-and-comer. You got Illinois State. And I'm like, uh, we're winners. So I don't know what you're talking about. They got to beat us. And we we go my sophomore year. We beat, end up beating, the, surprisingly, Northern Iowa beats Tulsa in the semifinals. And then we beat them in the championship. And it's the only time in Missouri Valley Conference, I, this, is a, this is still another thing. I'm really bad about letting go of stuff, and I'm probably petty, so please forgive me. And everybody that's watching will probably be laughing, saying, yeah, that's Chris in a nutshell. You realize that's the only time ever in the history of the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament that a guy from the losing team was the more, awarded the most outstanding player for the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament. Never has happened before. And it hasn't happened since. And it still bothers me because the semifinal game against Bradley had 22 points and 19 rebounds. The championship game, I had 20 points and like nine rebounds and four blocks, and we win. And they gave it to Cam Johnson. It still bothers me to this day. So <laughs> any host of us could have won. Marcus could have won it. Chris Lowry could have won it for hitting the shot against Missouri State. And he uh, had like a five-to-one assist to turnover ratio for the tournament. Paul could have won it because he, he shot 50 some percent from three point. I don't care. Somebody from Southern Illinois should have won it, not the dude from the losing team. So that's a sidebar note. So um, that'll be fun for people to ponder. <laughs> you guys were almost yeah, a victim of being too balanced, it sounds like. Well, yeah, we were, yeah, we were, we were balanced, but it was just, you know, who's playing well at the, at the right time. I mean, I mean, think about Marcus Timmons and I, I have 22 and 19 and, it may be 15. I think it's 22 and 15, nine offensive rebounds in the semifinal game against Bradley. Marcus has like 20 and 20 and 14 and has like eight offensive rebounds. I mean, we just absolutely dominated this team. I mean, the two of us, I mean, we scored like 30 some points in the second half of the game and it was just ridiculous. So you could have co co uh, conference tournament MVPs, whatever. You don't give it to the guy off the losing team. And mind you, he did uh, break uh, Hersey Hawkins' single-game scoring record in the semifinals against Tulsa. I think he had like 37, 39, something like that. I mean, he did have a big game, so I won't take it too much away from him. But that's like Lakers, you won the, you won the world championship, and the MVP goes to Jimmy Butler. You're like, what? No. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how sophomore year went, and then junior year was – that was just a whole completely different thing because I, I played that whole year like really angry and just super highly competitive and just on edge because I wanted to. Now I felt like it was my obligation to, well, shoot, we've done it last two years. So now I'm a leader on this team. We have to do it now, you know? And so, and I think the guys fed off of that. And, and so that was good. What's your all time favorite game as a Saluki? Oh, mm. all-time favorite game, game is a Saluki. Let's see here. Um, my freshman year, beating Illinois State at home after Mike Vandegaard shoots the half-court three at the end of the game and then sticks his hands out and, and does this at half-court, um, beating them at our place um, was – that one stands out. Um and that was in front of 10,000 people. Um, let me see. What else would be a standout game? I mean, my junior year, we had some, we had some really good games. We beat Bradley at home, sellout game over holiday break. And um, that was a really good game. Marcus and I, we, we beat up on them pretty good. Um, that won't be a memorable one. Um, my last game as a, at Southern against Evansville on ESPN. Um, that was the last game my dad got to watch me in person. Um, had a pretty good game against them. We beat them on ESPN. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of them. Um, you know, I, I don't ever like to like boast about having big games and losses because you lost. So that's not, those are very those are memorable. Maybe the most memorable one might be at. Um, Southeast Missouri, my junior year, 
So I hit a hit a uh, turnaround jumper, hit hit the rim like three times before it falls in. Um, and that one was more personal because uh, Ron Shoemake said that I wasn't good enough to play Division One basketball whenever I was in high school. So that one was more personal. But um, no, we had man, we had a lot of a lot of really good games. Beating Tulsa um, in the Missouri Valley tournament. Beating Tulsa at home, Shane Hawkins hits the runner. Um, that was a that was a good one. Sold out crowd. Um, so the ones that are most memorable are big games when we had big home crowds. Those are always the ones that were were like special. First thing that comes to mind when somebody says the name Rich Heron to you. <laughs> um, you better uh, be able to uh, decipher. English really, really well, um, you know, and nervous Nelly. Those would probably be the two things that I would, I would probably use in a nutshell to describe Coach Heron. Um, but the one thing Coach Heron was, he was uh, very, very smart. Um, he knew when to step in and he knew when to stay out of the way. Um, and he recruited guys and allowed them to play to their strength. I'm not a pro if I don't play for Coach Heron. I don't I don't believe. Um because he he recognized in me what I was capable of and he allowed me to play and and do what I do what I did and what I did really well. And and it takes a coach to understand that and allow it um and be accepting of what you want to become, both as a and it doesn't fit into the team scope of things. And so I was appreciative of him for that um, because, I mean, we had some talented guys. I mean, Paul was talented. Marcus was ex- Marcus might be the most talented player I've ever played with in my life, and that's saying a lot. I played with Kevin Garnett, Charles Barkley, Ron Artest. I mean, I played with some really good players, and, and I would say Marcus is right up there, in my opinion, arguably, with LeBron. Um, I mean, he just, he was special. I mean, he, Marcus, people don't realize how special he was. Um, he just couldn't get out of his own way, but golly, he was a special, special, special. I mean, so talented. And I wish Marcus had my work ethic and my desire to want to be great because I wasn't as talented as he was, just naturally gifted and talented. But I had an unbelievable work ethic and I had a passion for the game. And wanted to be, I wanted to be great. I think Marcus played because it was just a thing to do at the time. But boy, when he flipped the switch, I'm telling you, it was it was special. It was special. Like sitting in the locker room before we play Old Dominion, and he says, Hey CC, I think I'm gonna get a triple double tonight with that NBA scout in town. And I look at him, I'm like, what? He's like, get a triple double tonight. I was like, okay, Marcus. And you know, and it's just like you go out and you're playing, and before long, is Marcus got 14 points, 13 rebounds, nine assists, and you're like, "Wow," you know. Or at Missouri State, he says, "Hey, I'm gonna get a triple double today, but I'm gonna get it with uh, points, rebounds, and block shots." And you're like, "What? Like, who does that? Who can sit at their locker and say I'm gonna do that, and then go out and actually do it?" I mean, that that was what I found amazing about him. So, but in terms of Coach Heron, man. Um, classy guy, high level of character. I mean, he's a, he's a good man, and I I'm appreciative because he stuck to his word with me. Um, he he told my mom he's like, you know, I think he's got a chance to make some money playing basketball someday, um, whether he goes overseas or whatever. He says, but he says, Pearly, may I promise you this? He'll be a great young man when he leaves our program. And he says, that's the one thing I can guarantee you that he'll be, he'll be a great young man when he leaves my program. And so that was, that was what meant probably more to me about him than anything else, because he was very, very big on character, doing things the right way, how you treat people with respect and class. And, you know, those are all things that I was taught to do when I, I was, as I grew up. And so it was just, it was great to have someone that had an extension of that. And all these years later, I don't, I don't know if it's because of Coach Aaron, but but maybe in part, you've gotten into coaching. Um, it, why did coaching call you once you were done playing basketball? Oh, man. <laughs> you know what's funny is um, when I was in high school, my high school coach t- 
told me, he says, you're going to be a coach someday. I told him, you're absolutely nuts. I'll never be a coach. I get to college. We're starting to play 3-2 zone a little bit my freshman year. Coach Aaron pulls me to the side and he says, hey, I watched you play in high school. Why don't you, why don't you show them how to do it? I'm like, what? Just get out there and show them. And I was like, okay. Hey, so if I'm here and the ball goes there, I got to get here. Well, you got to get to that spot and you get to that spot. And then when the ball moves, that's how it determines. Like, so basically everybody's in a spot to guard their man, but there's extra help defense from three different people. And he and Coach Watson both, yeah, you'll be a coach whenever you get older. I was like, nah, nah I'm not going to do that. My rookie year in the NBA, Cotton Fitzsimmons tells me, Rook, you're gonna be a, you're gonna be a, a hell of a coach someday. I was like, I don't know why people keep saying this to me, but that is not gonna happen. And lo and behold, I start a skill development business. I get a job coaching in high school basketball. I coach AAU basketball, and I end up being a coach. <laughs> um, and here you are. Part of it comes just from the fact that you learn how to play the game a certain way and it's embedded in you. And then you want to be impactful to the next generation of basketball players. And if you're going to be impactful, then you have to be responsible for their tutelage. And for me, having such a high level of respect for the game itself and so what it's provided for me, I felt is my obligation that, you know, if I have knowledge that's been passed on to me from the great coaches that I've played for and been an op- had an opportunity to be a part of and learn from, I'm not continuing to grow the game like your Dr. J's and your Oscar Robertson's and your Walt Frazier's who vested in people so that they could vest in me because without them, there's no Michael Jordan, there's no Magic, there's no Isaiah, there's no Larry and them, but there's no MJ, there's no Scotty, there's no, there's none of those guys, there's no without those guys. And then there's no Kobe, there's no Shaq without those guys. And, you know, so, so I felt that my duty of my own small space in the world to be obligated to pay that forward you're literally passing it down to the next generation in your family coaching your daughter right now at k-state did you have to get permission from her to coach her or was that non-negotiable no that was you know what's funny is so um whenever i got the call and asked to come down to interview for the job here they had not offered her a scholarship and so when I came down to my interview and I sat in my Coach Mitty's office, I just told him, I said, hey, I, said, I just want to say this before we get started. Um, my path is my path. My daughter's path is her path. I said, and if you're thinking that we are attached at the hip in this basketball thing, we're not. So if you're only asking me, interviewing me for a job to get her, then let's just stop this now. Uh, appreciate you having me down and I'll be on the next one burning. And he was like, well, Chris, we haven't even offered her a scholarship yet. So he said, we're here because I've had an opportunity to do some research on you. We have a position available and I think that you're going to make a heck of a coach at this level. So um, once I took the job here, we moved here. I told them whenever we had our first meeting, I said, hey, you guys have to recruit her. I said, don't leave it to me. I said, we're not talking about Kansas State when I go home and I turn back into that. We're talking about what's the best for your future. And I said, now the beauty is you have access to her every day because she comes up here to work out with me every day. So talk to her. And so she got an opportunity to build and grow a relationship with the rest of our staff through that. So. Yeah, it's been good. I noticed she's wearing your number 43. Yeah, that's a, that's a, um, you know, that was a tradition that we started with my, my basketball academy in, um, in the Twin Cities area. That um, every year I have somebody that I worked with that, that became a special player, that they got better. But to do that, you had to go through baptism by fire, so to speak. So, one of the first ones, Chris Humphreys played University of Minnesota, drafted a um, lottery pick by the Utah Jazz, journeyman, you know, 13, 14, 14-year 14 NBA vet. Um, when he was in high school, I worked with him, started working with him going into his sophomore year. 
he wears number 43. Um, then the next one after that was um, Anthony Tucker, University of Iowa. Now he's playing professionally in China. He wore number 43. Next guy after him, Mike Bruschewitz, um, played at Wisconsin. He wore number 43, high school and college. I mean, so so then it became a traditional thing, like where the next really good player is like, it was like kind of awarded to them from the from the guy stepping down, like, all right, man, hey, you go wear 43, you gotta, you gotta bring it. Ross Travis plays with the New York Jets now, played at Penn State. He wore number 43. And so it, it kind of just continued to to go along with then. As my daughter's growing up, she's around all these guys. They're at the house. She's at the gym with them. She's working out with them. And so then she popped up and was like, I'm number 43. It's family tradition. That's our, you know, that's my, at my grandma's age when she had my dad, that's, so I'm going to be 43. And so that's kind of how it came. And then my son has to get a double extra large jersey for his high school, but he's number 43. So, you know, it's a, it's a real honor more for my grand, for my mom. Um, she was 43 years old when she had me. That's why 43 is significant because that's why I wore the number 43. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the significance behind the number, but the number itself carries a lot of significance um, because that means you're willing to work harder and endure more than the next person to be the best you can possibly be. So that's kind of the significance of 43. Oh, that's a, that's a great story and that it's been passed down. And I bet the convenient thing too is, you know, most people are fighting over the number 23 or the number eight or three or one, but 43 should always be available, right? Yeah. My son gets mad because he said, dad, 43 is usually like for a post player. So I'm a guard. And so my son is skinny. He's about six foot tall, about 135 pounds. He's skinny as a rail, but he's like, he got on this big old Jersey and he's got to wear three undershirts underneath it to try to fill into it. It's pretty funny, but yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of, uh, lot of fun. Oh, uh, that's a great image. Uh, well, hey, Chris, appreciate the time. Uh, good luck. Your uh, official season opener coming up Sunday, November 29th against Southern University. Not not Southern Illinois, but Southern University from Louisiana. Uh, yeah. Best of luck this year. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and you know, best of luck down there as well. Um, I was on a Zoom with, with uh, Brian and um, his his team back in the summertime. It was It was great to get an opportunity to – talk to those guys and get a sense for, you know, some of them really don't, didn't have any idea about the, the history and the guys that have been down the path of the glitz and glamor of what you see now wasn't always here. And, you know, they didn't even realize that their coach had played half of a season on two broken legs at one point. They didn't, didn't even know it. And I was like, you guys probably hear coach Mullins always talk about how tough he is. And they're like, yeah, you know, every once in a while I was like, no, he's, he's a tough SOB, and you guys got to know that. And they're like, well, said, you guys, are real, you guys know that he played part of a season with two broken legs? And they're like, what? I was like, yeah. I said, like, could hardly walk, but he was playing 40 minutes a game on two broken legs. And it's like, wow, no, he didn't. I said, yeah. So, so I said, whenever he's telling you about being tough, he embodied it, so he kind of gets it. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so um, so yeah, it's been it's been good to see. I, I hope they have great success this year. I'm I'm happy that the school made the right choice um with who they hired there since Chris was no longer there. Um I'm I'm thankful that they got the right guy, I think, that can take the program forward. And so man, I'm glad that I'm excited to watch them and, and support them and, and be a part of that process. For sure, for sure, we're excited too. Come see us when you can, huh? After Man, the pandemic, I, I sure will. Boy, God willing, we'll we'll be able to uh, get away from all of this junk of not being able to travel, and um, hopefully, love to be able to get back for a game or Missouri Valley tournament, something you know, just to get an opportunity to to watch him play and be supportive of, of Brian and his efforts that he's putting in, and um, you know, hopefully, the women's team will continue. They they had a pretty strong year last year which was good to see um hopefully they'll be able to continue to grow and continue to get better let's do it hope to see you soon yes sir thank you for your time i appreciate it thank you chris all right